Yeah, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the talk. Um, I will talk about how corporations adopt open source. And uh, this is usually not happening all at once, but it's happening in stages, it's a progression. And what I want to do in this uh, presentation is to develop a mental model how you can understand how this progression happens. This is useful because for companies, uh, it's always a question to figure out what to do to adapt, ad adopt open source, how to deal with it. Um, so it's useful as a guidance for companies, uh, what to do, but it's also helpful for communities to understand where companies are, because that also can um, help sometimes to explain why some things work and some things uh, might not work when uh, interacting, uh, interaction between communities and companies is happening. So when we start, um, I think the question if a company is doing open source is uh, usually not a question anymore. It's clear, you have to do it, um, uh, otherwise uh, you probably are not in the software business. But then the question is how do you do that? And this question is not so easy to answer because uh, there are a lot of different aspects you, you have to figure out. Um, you have to think about uh, legal questions, you have to think about technical questions, you have to think about business questions, you have to think about your internal culture, community culture, interaction um, uh, between the two and everything, and this is hard. Um, you, you could actually say um, open source today is literally rocket science. So this is the Mars helicopter, this is flying on Mars, and it's running on an open source stack. And one number actually is in this context, um, I think, um, interesting and significant. Um, the software which is uh, running in this helicopter was written by 12,000 people. And uh, these are not 12,000 people um, employed by a software company uh, at NASA and working on, on the helicopter, but this is open source contributors all over the world, which projects are used in this software stack. So you have to deal with this dimension and these questions which arise from that. So now, as a company, you might ask, what do I have to do to get to this point where I achieve success with open source and happiness and profit? How do we get there? And there are a couple of answers uh, which I would uh, briefly describe before I come to a, a more thorough description of the different elements. Uh, there's a bit of prior art, um, uh, maturity models, um, which uh, describe how open source adoption is happening. And I will touch these um, and uh, explain a little bit uh, what, what they are doing. So the first model I know, um, that, that's from uh, Peter Cabon, uh, 2006, so already quite some time ago. Um, he was working as a CTO for Nortel at, at that time, and what he was doing is he was looking into different uh, open source companies, doing research and understanding what are the different uh, factors, um, how op open source companies operate. And he found these five uh, categories plotted over two axes. And uh, what I found very interesting is that um, the, the two terms he came up with um, at, at the uh, top end, where the companies were using open source most thoroughly, uh, were that there's value co-creation happening and uh, value appropriation. So this is really not something technical, but it's about creating value and how, how to get value from open source. When we look at another model, um, um, a couple of years later, 2011, um, Kyla Moyes um, came up with that, working for Sony Mobile. Um, uh, this looks very similar, and it's, all these models are inspired, actually. It's, uh, it's not distinct um, uh, research, but it's, uh, of course, kind of a community development which is happening there. And he's also uh, describing this in the, these um, uh, five steps. Um, the axis is effort, um, uh, and the other axis is value. And uh, what is interesting in this model is that there are these two um, areas which he calls the engineering-driven area and, and the business-driven area. So this is something which is um, kind of the involvement of, of the first model where you say, okay, the motivation changes over time. The, the more proficient you become with open source, uh, the more business-driven uh, your engagement will be. And he also defined five key performance areas to describe these uh, levels um, uh, more detailed, and then you can look into the different elements, what is happening on, on which level. A third model, um, which uh, is uh, used, uh, this is uh, from some um, uh, 
yeah, documents uh, material from Ibrahim Haddad, who's working for the, for the uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, he is actually using this uh, maturity model also in, in his publications uh, quite a bit. And I picked out one um, diagram there, which I think is interesting because this also has this kind of levels. Um, you have this um, increasing involvement and effort on, and uh, you advance on, on these uh, stages. And, and he identifies certain activities which are happening there. So on the consumer level, you are with evaluating, using, um, deploying, that's um, key actions, inter um, activities you need to do there. And later you'd get into, for example, starting new initiatives when, when you go to the, to the leader level. And a very recent publication um, just a few weeks ago is uh, the evolution of the open source program office from the to-do group, uh, which is the subgroup of the Linux Foundation. Um, this uh, looks at the same development from the perspective of open source program offices, so the uh, parts of the organization which are dealing with open source. And you can see ag again um, similar levels um, and this goes um, a little bit deeper here in terms of actually what, what kind of area you, you have to, to cover. So a big thing, for example, is the legal education, which needs to happen when you want to use open source responsibly. You have to understand the legal implications and have to um, yeah, find ways how, how to do that. So this is the look from the OSPO level. And the last um, uh, yeah, yeah, model I, I want to show here, um, this is the good governance initiative. Good Governance Initiative, this also, also is something pretty new from last year. Uh, this is a publication from the OSPO Alliance. Um, it's explicitly not a maturity model, but a management framework. And uh, they have modeled uh, the key activities which um, you need to do uh, when managing open source in five levels, which are um, yeah, associated with, with Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs. So you can say, uh, you come from usage, trust, culture, engagement, strategy. That's the categories where there is a very detailed description of uh, what you need to do in these areas if you want to responsibly manage open source. And we will come to that um, a little bit later, uh, talking about um, how, how this um, all maps together. So, um, I took this kind of as, as uh, uh, yeah, the source of my research to put together um, uh, my mental model of how I see uh, companies interacting with open source and how this progresses. And uh, would like to describe this in these five stages, deny, use, participate, contribute, lead. And I will show you more details about what, what I see in these stages. And uh, the, the, the perspective I want to take here is not, not as an assessment of where a company is, but more like, like a communication framework, how to talk about the different activities you need to do on the different levels. You can understand what is happening and also when and what you might want to do and what you, <coughs> what you maybe also might not want to do if you are not at the, at the level where this is necessary. So the first stage, deny. Um, we have heard that in the past quite a bit. Open source can't work. Um, there will never be an operating system uh, which is as stable as a proprietary operating system. We know that this is not true. Um, what you still hear nowadays uh, quite often is we don't use open source. Um, for example, to put some data behind that, this is a representative study done by Bitcom uh, under German company, companies. 71% uh, say they use open source and 26% think they don't. So they say we don't use open source. Um, I think we all know that this can't be true. <laughs> so, but once you realize that you use open source, um, then you have to start dealing with this. And this is the first stage where you use open source, where you passively consume open source. So you uh, use it in your infrastructure, use it for development. Um, and this often is uh, uh, driven by engineers who start to just use some pro pro uh, projects in the infrastructure. Um, and uh, from there you develop uh, all the necessary infrastructure and tools and legal uh, uh, tooling and so on to, to actually do that. And this is something which happens because using open source software is easy and fast. You can just use it. The license allows that. You don't have to negotiate. You don't have to pay, 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 pay license fees. Um, so uh, this is very fast from a technical point of view. 
Then at the next stage, you realize that um, there actually is the opportunity to interact with the community and that, that this is valuable. So if you use open source software, you can actually also talk to the developers, you can create bug reports, you can interact with the community. Um, and uh, this is good for a company because uh, th that's, that's a way how to make your usage of open source more safe because you maybe can say something about uh, the stability of the community, what to expect and so on. You can maybe influence a little bit with um, uh, input and conversations. So you learn from that and um, you, you get to interact, but on a level which is uh, still relatively easy for a company because the company doesn't have to give anything away. That happens on the third stage, contribute. This is when active participation in open source projects um, is becoming uh, part of what a company is doing. So when there's not only this um, interaction between people, but when you actually contribute code and you have a way how to make this legally fine and uh, uh, are compliant with your own processes, uh, that you are able to contribute code to open source communities. Um, and. Uh, the important realization on this stage is that the way how you influence open source projects is by contributions. There's no other way. You, you can give money to open source projects, but the, the act, only real way how to shape open source projects is to put in work. That, that's that's how, how it works. So in, in, at this stage, companies can actually shape the software they are using uh, by becoming part of this um, yeah, contributor community. And on the fourth stage, um, the stage where you lead, um, this is becoming more global and open source becomes uh, part of your strategy and your strategic uh, uh, yeah, way how, how you deal with open source ecosystems, but you also use open source as a tool to advance your business. It becomes part of your co um, core business and this is where this appropriation of co-created value is happening. So you re realize that there's a lot of value in open source more than you can ever ever create yourself and you make use of that. And uh, this is uh, one area where this is uh, key is the digital transformation. So when you have to deal with so, so much software that it's impossible for you to develop that yourself, to manage that all yourself, the, the only answer to that is uh, uh, leveraging open source in, in the right way to, to be able to meet the demands of uh, what, what you need to do there. One example for, for the strategic use of open source is Android. Um, of course, you can maybe debate about if you think the development model is open enough or not, but uh, what is clear is that uh, Google was able with Android to, to shape an industry and completely change uh, the, the game there by making it uh, very, very easy to use Android and making it open source, uh, removing some barriers there, and uh, by not being as protective, actually being more successful. Uh, one nice illustration of that is that actually the logo itself is also on an open source li license or Creative Commons, so I could make it blue. So these are the five stages. And um, what I now want to talk about is uh, if we look at that as a progression. So one way to look at it is if I'm a company and I, I'm at a certain stage, what do I need to do to get to the next stage, to uh, get more value from the open source um, ecosystem or my engagement? And um, from, from that, I, I want to look at um, the activities which take place at these stages. So you can see, okay, that's where we are and that's what we need to do to get to the next level. So how do we get there? We'll skip the deny stage um, and start with the use stage. So on, on this stage, what, what you are doing is um, you, you have to basically get the basics right. So this is about learning about open source. Um, you have to uh, come up with an initial, initial strategy, which can be something simple like uh, we use open source as development tools, but we are not doing any product development with open source or contribute. So a, a technical strategy which makes life of developers easier. Uh, you will have to create some kind of policy how, how to deal with that. You will have to uh, train people in awareness of open source so that they know, okay, not everything I can download from the internet is actually open source and free to use. You have to inventory your, your usage so you can actually do the legal compliance work and so on. So you can make sure you have um, uh, the, the rights. Uh, you need to deal with questions like security and support. Um, how do I do that when I'm using open source, which is, uh, can be the same or also can be very different from 
uh, proprietary software. And you might establish um, an internal central point of contact, so kind of the prototype of an open source program office. So in our case, in uh, my company, um, that's my title, uh, my title at DB Sister where I work is um, the title of open source steward. So you have um, <coughs> uh, a central point of contact um, for dealing with these questions, uh, but more internally faces and not yet outward facing. So on the next stage, um, you come to uh, participation in communities. Um, so there are uh, activities where you have these kind of informal interactions. So you need to know, um, your developers need to know, okay, what can I do uh, when I'm talking to projects, um, opening bug reports, for example. Um, you will also um, identify what are actually the important projects for me, so where do I want to talk to, where, where do you want to put some more effort into. Um, on this level also companies uh, start to realize, okay, we can actually with monetary support, like um, uh, buying support contracts or becoming a member of a foundation, I can actually support the open source communities which are important for me. Um, and. Uh, to manage this, uh, you will need um, people who are able to do that and to kind of also be the face of the company in terms of, of open source, and that's where the open source program office often is, is the right uh, thing to do. Um, events in open source, uh, open source events, participation uh, is another thing, so people will show up at events like this, uh, maybe not as the sponsors, but as participants, and they will start to talk to the community. And this also often leads to um, a way that um, a culture change um, has to happen because it's a different way to deal with an open source community than to deal with internal um, company development. So this is where uh, uh, something like inner source or trying open source culture in the safe environment of your own company is happening. So one illustration of that is the, the OSPO landscape where you see the companies who already have open source program offices. This is a serviced by the to-do group as well. You can see where this is going. Then contributing. Um, <clears throat> this is one step where it actually becomes a little bit more difficult for companies because they have to figure out how to actually do contributions. Um, so how can, as a company, I can make sure that I give uh, my developers the rights to do that and the means to do that. So you will come up with a contribution policy. Uh, you will have to make sure contributors know how to do that. Um, uh, this will, become, will uh, be something where you invest resources, so you need to integrate it with your business strategy. Um, and this can also be something where it uh, plays a role in recruiting, uh, because when you can attract people who want to do open source in your company, you will get other people if, uh, than if you can't provide that. And at this stage, of course, external partnerships also become uh, more important because you're actually providing uh, yeah, more work to that. One example, by the way, um, is the DB Sister open source contribution policy. So I'm working for DB Sister, which is the IT um, subsidiary of uh, Deutsche Bahn, the German railway company. And uh, we have published our open source uh, contribution policy there uh, on GitHub um, as one way how to do that. There are certainly many other ways how to do that, but this is an example um, how we figured out how to do open source in our company. Now the lead stage, um, there you will expand your memberships, uh, maybe become more strategic, not only become part of a foundation, but influence the direction of a foundation, be, uh, put in more people. Um, you might do things like open sourcing proprietary code and put up your own projects. You might uh, even want to move to an upstream first model where, where your products are developed in the open. Um, and you will have to uh, accept the fact that you have to give more autonomy to your contributors who are working on company's behalf, but in an open source uh, community, people are usually working on eye level and it doesn't matter so much uh, where you are coming from. And this takes courage. And this also is the, maybe the, the, the place where you will start your own open source events. Um, I think that's a pretty typical activity for a company which realizes that you already have reached some level of maturity. So these are typical, uh, typical activi activities. Um, I want to uh, put in a, a couple of brief thoughts at the end here 
about how to use that. One is that the reality is actually not that straightforward. So you will skip a step, you will move back, or maybe different parts of the company are on a different speed or on different levels, and that's okay. Uh, it's not a model which uh, has to fit for everything, but sometimes it actually can explain why skipping a step might cause problems. The other question is, uh, where are we actually on this, this um, arrow? Um, how mature are we? And um, again, from, from the study from the Bitcoin, um, I interpreted the number a little bit, but you can tell from this that actually the majority of companies still is on this use level. And especially for companies who are not big software companies selling software but using software as a means to an end, I think that's actually also quite okay to, to be there. And coming back to the Good Governance Initiative, um, this is a rich resource of activities. So what I was trying to do is to come up with some kind of heat map, how to map what of these activities are actually relevant at what stage. So if I'm a company who are just struggling to start using open source software, then I will probably not deal with thing, things like putting all my enterprise IT on open source software, but I will first try some, some different things. So this is a rough mapping here of, of the different area of the Good Governance Initiative. And I actually would be interested in more discussions about that and to see how, how this can be mapped, how we can make it uh, more practical in, uh, in the use of uh, the, this framework uh, to, to make progress when you want to mature in terms of open source. Uh, usage and contributions. And this is just a rough estimate. Um, uh, is, you can certainly debate uh, this heat, heat map to a large degree. And last thing I want to say here, um, uh, I've talked about how companies advance on this um, uh, um, yeah, adoption of open source in, in a company, uh, but this also is something which is personal. Um, if you look at individual contributors, if you have uh, people, uh, developers, um, there's a similar path uh, coming from a user, uh, uh, becoming a contributor, um, accepted as a committer in a project, uh, maybe becoming the maintainer. So this is a very similar path, and this will, will be reflected also in, in, the, in the company path. So if you if you have people who are maintaining open source projects, you are actually able to work in the strategic way. And the other way around, if your company is positioned to work in the strategic way, you will attract people on, on this level as well. So this also is a nice personal development path, uh, which in some companies, which have formal career paths, actually might be a nice thing to introduce. Yeah, so this is the model I wanted to present. Um, I'm very happy about questions about, uh, discussions about that, so please contact me um, at any time. And uh, just one last remark, um, this, is a, um, this is a path uh, uh, of open source adoption in, in companies, uh, but um, I think we also have to note that this is also a path of openness, of courage, of truthful col collaboration, and uh, these are all things which I think are more important than ever. Thank you. Okay. So do we have any questions? Yeah. Hi, Cornelius. Yeah. Hi, Cornelius. Thanks for this great talk. Um, in which stage do you think is Deutsche Bahn in currently? I mean, Deutsche Bahn <laughs> is a large uh, organization globally, many entities and so on. So where would you describe um, your position currently? And is it uh, all over or is it just for particular parts? I think in general, I would say we are at the use stage. We are using a lot of open source software. We started to contribute um, and participate in some areas. Um, so it's, uh, I think, a little bit mixed. Uh, Deutsche Bahn is a complex company. And I think this is an example where actually you have different uh, stages in different parts of the company. Uh, but in general, I would say we are with the majority and um, trying our best to advance. Hi, thank you. Love getting the call out to the uh, GGI, the Good Government Initiative. I love a lot of the work that they're doing. Um, this is actually less of a question and more of a, hey, something cool. Um, at IEEE, we're working on a uh, study group for doing a standard in regards to open source software project governance. And so a call out to everyone is to please come and help participate because like GGI is one of the groups that we've invited that's participating as well as 
Linux Foundation and um, uh, Eclipse, Oasis, all of those different ones because I feel like one of the big things on that maturity level is understanding how to do the governance and how to do it well, yeah. especially on um, if you want to, if you could talk a little bit more on that leadership portion, because I think, you know, sometimes um, with appropriation, you get that negative connotation of it as right. well. So could you expand on that for me? Yeah, I think governance, of course, is a very important topic. And um, I think it shifts on, on this uh, path. So at the beginning, you, you will uh, just be subject to the governance of the open source projects. You have to live with that. But then later, you will shape uh, governance also of projects as a company. And I think that's also very important for a company to uh, know how to set up good, I would say, open governance uh, to make sure that open source projects can actually live up to, to their expectations and that uh, yeah they are useful to companies, they are useful to the community, that there's a healthy ecosystem around that, you can rely on them. Governance definitely is, I think, an uh, important part where especially companies would, which go to this contribute stage have to think hard about how to do that. So any resources and guides about that, I think, are very much appreciated. So because we're running a bit late after the break, we take one more question maybe. Yeah, sure. Uh, so two things. First, thank you very much for the Deutsche Bahn app because I was using the Deutsche Bahn app and it has a very nice license statement in it. I got five people, including C-level in my company, to understand what compliance is based on that license statement. Ah, that was so amazing. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't have thought that I'd get the chance, but I have to, really most effective. Um, other case, because I was thinking for like Polycom, Deutsche Bahn app did it. Um, the other case is in terms of upstream, well, first, what I would normally understand is like, get rid of your bug fixes and your local forks and push the stuff up, upstream. Um, how well did that work with Deutsche Bahn so far? So, so I think that, that's exact, exactly one of these uh, areas where you have to learn um, how to do it. Um, it's very easy to do a bug fix locally, um, but then getting into the outside is something you have to learn. Um, I have to say, uh, for, for us, we are really mostly consumers, um, so, so we, we are not maintaining massive internal forks of open source software, at least as far as I can tell. Uh, um, <clears throat> so so th this is something which is, I, I would say, on our learning path uh, to be, I, I think it's, it's a barrier where, where you really have to first realize that this is possible and also that this is, it, it's valuable to do that. And uh, this needs learning um, uh, to, 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 yeah, to get there. 